Right. And the next thing that really st- struck me when I read Blitzscaling was, yes, there are multiple examples within the American and to a certain extent European uh, entrepreneurship context where there has been a history and a tradition of applying these techniques and seeing rapid and massive growth. But to a certain extent, if you really assess it, these are very, these are mature markets. These are countries with a deep history of entrepreneurship, technical leadership, etc. So from where we are sitting in India, India is at a very interesting stage where it is entering oh, yes. uh, that stage where it's looking to build massive companies. It's looking to grow very fast. And the companies are also exceedingly ambitious because they're being led by exceedingly ambitious individuals and teams. So my question to you is when you're looking at a developing or a adolescent economy, if I may use that term uh, in terms of entrepreneurship, uh, there is a certain skepticism that certain people might have towards the tactics of blitzscaling. So yes. could you talk a little bit about how should com- uh, companies which are growing in these geographies think about blitzscaling? Uh, a little differently than the standard U.S. Uh, case studies, so to speak. Absolutely. And this is one of the important things to note about blitzscaling. It's a general set of principles that needs to be adapted to the context in which it's being applied. And we specifically speak about blitzscaling in markets outside of the United States and Europe, primarily the United States. That's where most of our experience lies. Because in many cases, there will be less infrastructure, the market will be less developed. Not always, right? And I often tell people you'd be surprised by how poor the infrastructure in the United States is in many ways. Uh, We are behind on internet access. We are behind in many ways on some of our mobile services. If you've ever traveled to the United States, you know that our airports are a disgrace. And so there are many ways in which the United States can actually be behind as well. There's no reason to believe the United States is always in the forefront of things. Nevertheless, when you are blitzscaling in an environment where you don't have as much of the infrastructure, let's call it the delivery infrastructure, the payment infrastructure, the human capital, then what you need to do when you're blitzscaling under those circumstances is to build much of that infrastructure yourself. And this causes blitzscaling in emerging markets or developing markets to be slower because there is more that you have to do. Or you cannot just plug and play into existing infrastructure. You may have to develop it yourself. And so over in China, Alibaba has to develop its own logistics infrastructure. It can't just tap into UPS like you would in the United States. Alibaba has to tap and develop its own payments infrastructure. It can't just use the Visa or MasterCard network because people are not banked and they do not have those accounts. And so these are things that the Blitzscaler has to take into account. However, If you are able to build that infrastructure, then that becomes a powerful competitive moat that allows you to fend off competitors. And it becomes a foundation on which you can build. So in many ways, what happens is there is a longer startup period for blitzscaling in a developing market. But then once it gets close to scale, it often accelerates and is growing faster than a blitzscaler in an established market like the United States because it now has massive competitive advantages over its competitors. And we saw this in China with Alibaba. We saw this in, Brazil, uh, in, in Latin America with Mercado Libre. And we see it playing out in India as well. If you were able to build the infrastructure and then you were able to really be much more effective. And there are times when the government can come in and actually help. One of the markets that we operate in is called Brazil. And Brazil is obviously like India. It's part of the BRICS, Brazil, Russia, India, uh, China. I can't remember which the S stands for. Somebody will remind me at some point in time. But uh, Brazil recently introduced just a year or two ago something called PIX, which is a payment system sponsored by the government. Usually, the governments are not very smart. They don't do this, right? It's up to the private sector to create a payment system, and that can result in very valuable companies in the United States, a company like a PayPal, for example, or a Stripe, and over in India with you know some uh, ups and downs, but a company like Paytm, for example, you know, providing payment infrastructure can be very powerful. In Brazil, the government actually created a payments infrastructure PIX that made it very easy for everyone 
in the country to do payments online. And because it was a government offering, the government could say, you need to pay your government bills with this. So it gives an inherent customer that everyone has to deal with. And so that helped create the conditions for new businesses to arise in Brazil. So this kind of infrastructure is the big difference. The other big difference, as you sort of intuited, but one which India is well positioned to, to deal with, is the human capital side. So on the human capital side, it is really challenging to grow if you do not have people with some experience with growth. And so it, it, the Silicon Valley of the United States has a tremendous advantage because for decades, people have been growing these companies. And so there's just much more human capital available here per capita than just about any other place in the world. However, a place like India, which of course has the world's largest population, which has a fantastic higher educational system. Obviously, you know, there are I'm very familiar with the various IIT campuses because we would always try to hire as many of those graduates as possible, whether it was at DE Shaw or any other company. But then, of course, there are plenty of other great institutions as well. There are so many smart people in India that you have a lot of that human capital, but you have to find it. You might also, uh, as a nation, tap into the brain power of the diaspora. So many people of Indian descent have traveled to and been enormously successful in Silicon Valley. And at least some of them feel the tug of home and want to return and bring their human capital back with them. So in many ways, I feel like India is really well positioned. Broadly speaking, India has great demographics. It's got an enormous population and a big emerging middle class. Demographically, it's not sitting on a time bomb like China is in terms of an aging population yet. So there's still a lot of demographic dividend yet to come. India has fantastic leading educational institutions, great ties to the United States. The fact that English is one of the primary languages of the country, it's really an enormous set of advantages. And of course, there are disadvantages in terms of some of the elements of infrastructure and the federal system of governance and all that sort of thing. And there can be uh, there can be various things that hold things up. And maybe there are sectors of the economy that are too dominated by the existing players. But that being said, all told, if I were looking for opportunity in this world, I would say India is one of the best places to find it.